Pairing number 11, we're doing an acetyl acetylic acid um, and we're doing a separation. So we have a precipitate, so we want to do a filtration. We have these four apparatus to choose from. So I've done this experiment before. You can use A, you can use C. Um, I, I honestly don't even know what this is or what this is. This looks like a separation column. And then I don't know why there's this thing to release pressure or something. And this looks like a distillation type kit, but maybe one that feeds back in where you're doing a continual heating of reflux or something, I'm not sure. Uh, but either way, those are not the choices here. We're looking at A and C. And the difference between those, if you've never used one, in C, this is a, uh, an Erlenmeyer flask that has a, a little arm out of it. And this hooks up to a piece of tubing that hooks up to your sink. And as the water runs down the sink, uh, it pulls air, or pushes air out of the way, so it creates a, a drop in pressure and as the air molecules go from here through the tube and get pushed out by the water, then you create a, a pressure difference here than here. And so air ends up pushing the solution uh, through this much faster. So it's called vacuum filtration. It works the same as this, except it's a little better. Uh, and so this would be your choice to use for this. And so C is the better answer. It's the one I would use. Uh, so we'll go with that, that particular question. Uh, number 12, what's the safest method for performing a flame test? Uh, some of these are just weird. Uh, so, uh, so in, in general, be very skeptical of methanol for safety because methanol is probably the number one accident in high school chemistry labs. Uh, and so that's something you really don't want to do. In particular, you don't want to squirt methanol into a Bunsen burner from a meter away. That's a bad idea. That's going to create a flame leading back into your container, which can cause an explosion. So A should be the obvious choice not to pick. Now this one is done um, for a lot of things, although usually probably not live with the Bunsen burner. Really there's not a huge issue with that, but again, you have a very large explosion risk for the methanol if you haven't properly stored the bottle. Um, I honestly don't have a huge problem with using a Bunsen burner to light something. It's a high temperature, it's, it's easy to handle. Uh, it's a little odd, but, but I don't necessarily agree with that. But I would, I would not pick that on a test, I guess. Um, and then C and D, we're looking at a wooden splint instead of a methanol solution. So that's going to be safer because we lose that explosion risk for in really weird circumstances. And in the one, we're, we're heating it up in a Bunsen burner, and the other one, we're heating on a ceramic hot plate. Uh, either this is not, I don't think that would work at all. Um, and if it did, it might light the thing on fire, which I guess is kind of the point. But, but anyway, C is your, is your actual option that is safe and would work. So. Okay, for 13, we've got a bunch of organic chemicals. It wants to know which one is the high, highest normal boiling point. Um, so real quick, I'm going to try and I'm going to leave the condensed formula for the CH3s and CH2s. But here we have a carboxylic acid for A. And for C, we have an ester. says it's an aldehyde, um, kind of a similar to an ester group, but I'm not sure what the name of this functional group would be. Um, so starting with this, uh, my attention was drawn to these two, which have hydrogen bonding capabilities. They all are, are going to be very similar in molar mass. Uh, a lot of them look like isomers. So, so I was drawn to B and A. Um, and then, and then this to me was the obvious. That's, got, that's not going to boil at a very high temperature relative to these four. This one is an aldehyde group. Uh, and so again, I, I would get rid of that um, since it doesn't have the hydrogen bonding capabilities. I looked up the boiling points for these. So A was 141.2 degrees Celsius. C was 57 degrees Celsius, uh, 57.1. B was 97 degrees Celsius and D was 54 degrees Celsius. So you can see that kind of C and D there don't really fit into the scheme of which one's going to have the highest boiling point. At that point, uh, without knowing the boiling points, you should see these two as being similar. This has an extra oxygen, so it's got more electrons, so it's got stronger dispersion forces, but more importantly, it has more spots where it can hydrogen bond. 
because you can do a hydrogen bonding interaction between this oxygen and this hydrogen on separate molecules, or this oxygen and this hydrogen on separate molecules. So you have more hydrogen bonding sites and you have more polarity. And so that's gonna be something that's gonna cause stronger intermolecular forces. So you should be drawn to A for that particular one. Propanoic or propionic acid. All right, and then 14 here, basically what they want you to do in this one is they want you to construct a diagram for pressure versus temperature. So what I did was I took the normal melting point, normal boiling point, that's gonna be my one atmosphere. So I put a dot here for melt and a dot here for boil, and then I labeled them. So the one was 63.2 degrees, or 63.2 Kelvin, sorry. The other one was 77.4 Kelvin. Okay, and then it gives me a triple point at a lower pressure, and it's 63.1, which is just to the left. So I'm gonna exaggerate that a little bit and move that over there. Now the shape I'm getting here then is this. I'm getting this to here to here. Last point is a critical point. That's up at 33 atmospheres. So way up here at 126 Kelvin. So some point that I, I can't even get to up there. So where the critical point is. Okay, so then I ask which statement about nitrogen is correct. So the first one is, is getting at this. If the liquid were more denser, then as you increase the pressure, what you would see is the solid would turn into the liquid. So that's the case in water. And in water, we see a phase diagram that looks like this, although exaggerated where the solid compresses to form the liquid. And that density is reflected in the phase diagram. Because the slope of this goes to the right, or is a positive slope, uh, that's not the case for this. Most substances are like that. So A is not our choice. Okay. At sufficiently high pressure, nitrogen can be liquefied at 150 Kelvin. Um, and so what that's getting at is, is compared to your critical point. Okay. So when you're above 126 Kelvin, you can no longer uh, distinguish between the liquid and, and vapor or gaseous states. And so because we are above that point here, it, even if the pressure gets high, we're not gonna be able to change between the liquid and the gaseous states. So therefore, B is incorrect. So basically, we're above this, we're up in this region. Now we're at a point where we can go from gas to supercritical fluid or supercritical fluid to liquid by cooling it down. But at that temperature, you can't go from a liquid to, or gas to liquid. All right, then liquid and gaseous can coexist at 63.1 Kelvin in one atmosphere. This is true. Uh, at any temperature, you're always gonna have a small amount of vapor. Um, the coexist maybe is leading you towards kind of setting up equilibrium, which is also true, but uh, it's very uh, finicky or very, uh, it's, it's one of those technicalities. So, so at that point, this is true, it's an option, and this is a hard test, so maybe that's the thing. But we want to be suspicious and look and see what D says. Okay, so D says, if nitrogen is heated from 60 Kelvin to 70 Kelvin at 0.1 atmospheres, which is below this point, so if we're going from here to here, then it will sublime. We would go from a solid to gas then, that is true. There is no technicality to that, that's really easy. Uh, we're very close to the pressure, so we know that Probably this line is not extended out far enough that that's not true, so therefore we'd go with D as our choice. Okay. All right, 15, we have a vapor pr pressure question. So what I did for this was I started by figuring out from a Pevner calculation uh, what the pressure would be if all of that gas went into these conditions. So what I did was I figured out how many moles, I had 0.824, Grams, and I divided by the molar mass, what we've given, 141.9. So that came up to be 0.00581 moles. Okay, so I figured out the pressure. The pressure was 0.37 liters is equal to 0.00581 moles. Um, and then I did, I just did 0.0821 for my R value and the temperature of 266. So I solved for my pressure in atmospheres, and that came out to be 0.343 atmospheres. And then from there, I changed that into millimeters of mercury so I could I could kind of do a comparison of what they told me. Now, at this point, now I need to get into the conceptual. When they give me the vapor pressure here at that temperature, I can't exceed that. 
So if I didn't have enough chemical to reach the point where an equilibrium would be established, that's fine and I'll have that pressure. If this pressure had been 100 millimeters of mercury, that would have been my pressure. But I can't just create extra gas to, to add up the pressure just because the vapor pressure can be that. Okay, but this is my limit. At the point where I go beyond this, that means that some of this is going to stay in the liquid state. So, so this is going to go up to 110 millimeters of mercury, and then some liquid's going to form, and there'll be an equilibrium between them. But my vapor pressure will be 110. Okay. So 16 is a pretty tricky question. Here we're looking at barium chloride, and we're comparing it with mercury chloride. So before we get into the question, which has a couple statements that are going to be hard to kind of sift through, we want to figure out what's the difference between these. These both look like ionic compounds in a simple sense, but the mercury chloride is going to have a smaller electronegativity difference, so it's going to be a little bit more covalent in nature. Uh, and then um, in addition to that, we also have size differences potentially between the barium ions and the mercury ions. Um, and then also whatever weird relativistic effects that could come up with mercury might also implicate this. So what we want to do is we want to see if there is, is uh, a statement up here that will reflect on kind of the idea of mercury chloride being more covalent in nature than barium chloride for its particular structure. So if we come over here, the first one says barium chloride has a higher melting point than mercury chloride. Well, that's actually perfect because a more ionic substance would have a, uh, a larger melting point than something that's getting a little more dispersion force in nature that's holding it together. So A, we like. After that, we get barium chloride has a higher solubility in non-polar solvents. And if we're looking at kind of this being more ionic, we would expect this to be more soluble in polar solvents. So we don't like B. Barium chloride has a higher vapor pressure. That kind of contradicts this last one, right? This one is saying barium chloride sticks together better. This one's saying barium chloride sticks together worse. So we don't like that one. And then molten barium chloride has a lower electrical conductivity than molten mercury chloride. There's kind of two options that I see for that. One is, is that those two would have the same conductivity because they would have the same number of particles. It also doesn't really specify if it's in a certain amount, density, it's really hard to kind of gather in. The other option we have is that if this is ionic and this is molecular, then we're looking at a situation where that still is false because then the barium chloride would have a larger electrical conductivity. So D also is kind of leading us astray. At that point, we would go back and say A is our choice. Okay, 17 gives us a unit cell of thallium bromide. So what you need to know here is that each of these corner pieces counts for one eighth of an atom because eight of those cubes is going to be touching this particular atom. So this bromide is not, it's not eight bromides per each one thallium. The formula of this chemical is TLBR. So we have one thallium in the middle and then we have one total bromide of all, all the ones combined. So what we want to do is we want to figure out how many grams is that for those two atoms and what's the volume of this container. So for the masses, we want to take the molar mass um, that I believe for thallium, if I'm reading this correctly, is 29.4. We're going to divide that by 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms in a mole, which will tell us the grams per atom. Right. And we're going to add to that the molar mass of bromine. Well, I didn't write down what it said on the uh, thing, but I believe it's 79.9. Could be wrong on that, I'm pretty sure. Uh, we're also going to divide that by 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So the sum of those is going to be how many grams total. And if I put this up correctly, that comes out to be 3.395 times 10 to the negative 22nd grams, plus 1.327 times 10 to the negative 22nd grams. And that sums up to be 4.72 times 10 to the negative 22nd grams. So apologies if one of those is off. Then we need the volume of the container. So it tells us the side length is 397 picometers. So we want to change that into centimeters cubed, or centimeters. So picometer is 10 to the negative 12, centimeter is 10 to the negative 2, we need to divide this by 10 to the 10th. So our side length is going to be 3.97 times 10 to the negative 8 centimeters. 
So from there, we need to cube that to get the volume. And that comes out to be, I'm going to put that in right here, a volume of 6.626. times 10 to the negative 23rd centimeters cubed. So if we divide this by this, we get our density, and that comes out to be 7.54 grams per centimeter cubed. I'm going to go with B. I don't know why it's off. So. All right. Moving on from there, 18 is a pretty simple question. Um, metallic solids are going to stick together decently well, so we would not expect High vapor pressure, so that's probably our answer. Or not typical. Uh, high coordination number of atoms in the lattice. Uh, usually they're going to have a coordination number of 8 or 12. Uh, if it's a um, body center cubic, or if it's a face center cubic, uh, or cubic closed packed, it's going to be 12 or 8 for the coordination number, which is about as high as you reasonably could get. Uh, so B is definitely not our answer. Uh, high electrical conductivity is definitely a property of metals. High thermal conductivity, definitely a property. We'll go back and we'll circle it. Okay, 19, we kind of have a Hess's Law problem. Uh, so we want to take our O minus gas. We want to flip that to the other side. We're going to end up reversing this first equation. So let's call this our unknown reaction. Our unknown reaction can be formed by combining the top equation in the reverse manner. When we reverse that, of course, we're going to change the sign because we're doing products minus reactants instead of reactants minus products. So we end up with a plus 142 kilojoules per mole. And then our second equation we're going to leave as is. So we have our oxygen gas atom plus two electrons, plasma, O2 minus gas, and then of course, we cancel an electron, cancel one electron, cancel this, cancel this, and we end up with O minus plus one electron turns into O2 minus. Uh, and this we kept the same, plus 72. So really, we just need to add those two together. So we're going to end up with 844 charges. Right? Nothing too tricky there. And on to 20, also a pretty simple question. For entropy going down, we're looking for the number of gas molecules decrease in the reaction. So here we start with zero, we end with two, so it's going up. Here we start with liquid, we end up with one. Here we start with two and end with three. And then here we start with two and end with one. So D is our best option. Now, if all of these had been liquids into liquids or no change in gas molecules, we could have done a deeper analysis, but we don't need to at that point. 20 of the answers D and we can move on with our lines.